it looks like the doors are closing. We're all getting locked in. That's it. And uh, maybe I have power now over the slides. Yeah, great. Okay. So I would say about 60% of you I, I know, so you probably know me, uh, but there are a few fresh faces as well. So I'll just start off by saying that my name is Alex Satz, and uh, I, I've been working in the Dell field for 17 or 18 years now. And, and I only say that with the hope that as I present things, you'll believe what I'm saying is true because I've worked in this field for a very long time. Right, so, so I thought that I would set this up where I would talk about, let's say, problems or issues that we in the Dell world have had and how we at Wuxi are attempting to solve these problems. Doesn't mean that we've completely solved them though. And, and the first issue that I've come up with here isn't really a scientific or a technical issue, but it's more of a business and economic one. And that is how do academic labs, when they have a target, run a screen and find hits? Um, and the late Richard Lerner and uh, Wuxi teamed up in order to solve this problem because Richard believed that academic labs had a lot of cool targets, but they didn't have access to Dell screening platforms, especially industrial scale Dell screening platforms. So we set up dellopen.org in order to address this problem. And I'll talk a little bit about how that's set up and about what the outcome has been over the last few years on this single slide. So how it works is if you're an academic group, um, you request a kit from us and we send it to you and this is free. And you conduct the Dell screen in your own lab and then you send the wet lab samples back to us and we process it. And then we show you the results of your screen, but we don't show you the chemical structures. We just show you the metadata. Um, you can then choose your five best hits from your screen and we can synthesize those for you at cost and send them back to your lab and then you can test these in your own lab and whatever assays you might have to find out if these hits are indeed active in whatever way you would like them to be and if they are we simply provide you with the structures of those hits free of charge and there's no reach through claims or anything else and with those structures, you are then free to publish a paper. And we see several papers here on the right-hand side, which have come out recently. Or you're free to publish a patent or start up a company or whatever else you would like to do. And again, there's no reach through or payment that needs to go to us at Wuxi. In exchange, we do have the dellopen.org group. And they request that you let them know your target name and then at a later point, they're going to publish the metadata of your screen online to share with the dellopen.org group and other professors could feasibly look at your data and collaborate with you at a later time. All right, so, so that's, that's the workflow of how this Dell Open works. To date, we've uh, sent out 400 of these kits and 400 have come back to us. So actually we probably sent out many more and 400 have actually come back. Of the 400 that have come back, we've shared all that data with each of these groups. And in 60% of those cases, the enrichment looked nice and the professors wanted to follow up those hits and we synthesized hits for them. And in 85% of those cases, they have returned to us and said that the hits were indeed active in whatever assays they were running. And to date, we've had at least four papers coming out through those Dell Open hits. You're not required when you publish the paper to have our names on these papers or to even say that the hits came out of Dell Open, but it is something that, of course, we appreciate if you do. So the next topic is covalent screens. Um, so Zhao, Zhao Zhi spoke about this in an earlier session. Um, I would just add in my time in big pharma, um, I know that the HTS uh, screening deck when it comes to covalent ligands is not that great. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of space here in the Dell field in order to make things better by making collections of Dells where you can find a covalent hit. But this has always been a little bit tough in the Dell field and part, part of the problem is making the Dells, but probably a larger part is actually running the screens 
and consistently finding nice novel hits in the covalent area. So we at Wuxi, we've done two different POCs and we've discussed this or I brought this up at the last DDC. So I won't go, to, go into the details of that uh, again, but we did publish a paper on 3CL Pro and that data is shown here. And one of the hits that came from those screens is shown here. We also did a POC with BTK. And again, we found hits there. And I discussed this at a previous DDC. So in the interest of time, I won't go into those details again. I would highlight that we work with six different warheads. These are all uh, in order to target a cysteine. So they're all quite stable. And we've made 72 DELs that cover a total of about 60 million discrete structures. And so those are the structures that we can screen against a target that comes into our hands. When we do make new DELs, we want to test them and we want to make sure that they're acting in the way that we expect them to act. And we do that with our standard POC, which is 3CL Pro. And an example of that is shown right here. So we run a screen against 3CL Pro, against our new collection of covalent DELs, and we see enrichment along the y-axis, and we see copy count along the x-axis, and we see the hits that are most enriched showing up right here, including, for example, compound one and compound two. Now, when we run this screen, but before we add the DEL, we've incubated with a known ligand that blocks the active side of 3CL Pro, and in that case, all of the enrichment is wiped out. So this is a case where we make the DELs, we run it against a target that we know works well, we see the enrichment as we should, and when we block the expected binding pocket, the enrichment is completely wiped out. And now we can look at our collection of DELs and say, everything is working properly. So keep in mind compound one and two because they sort of travel through the next couple of slides and are used as examples. So how do you follow up a potential covalent DEL hit. In the DEL world, there are things that you can do that are a little bit different from the rest of the world. So as a, for instance, we can remake compounds one and two, but we can resynthesize them with the barcode attached. And then we can incubate with the target and we can look now at the gel shift and we can see that compound one and two when added to 3CL Pro leads to a nice, easy to see shift in the band on the gel. And this is something which perhaps in your normal covalent ligand discovery, you wouldn't often do or ever do. We can also do the more normal way, which is we synthesize the compounds in a traditional synthetic fashion, and then we test them in an HTRF assay in order to see if they are indeed active or not. And again, we see that they are active. Um, and so between these two kinds of tests, we know that they're active, they're hitting the, the active site pocket. And we know that they are covalently bound. They're not just interacting with the pocket. So there's more variety. There, there's, there's more ways and decisions that you need to make when you're actually conducting the screen in order to find a covalent hit than when you're running a, a, a normal reversible DEL selection. And I'm not going to give you like a... a, a, a a uh, one size fits all answer to what your target might need. But we at Wuxi, we're doing many of these screens and we're collecting um, uh, a database of know-how about what conditions might be best for certain, tar tar certain targets. Uh, a couple of examples here of things that you can vary and the results of the screen are gonna change. So as a, for instance, the way in which you work up the selection after it's done or the elution method. Um, here we have labeled method number one on the left and method number two on the right. And depending upon which method you use, the hits that you find will be different. Now in this case, compounds one and two from the prior slides, they enrich in both methods one and two. But other than that, we see a lot of different hits showing up in method one that we don't see in method two and vice versa. Also, the incubation time is very important. So for a reversible DEL selection, incubation time usually is not very important. But for a covalent DEL selection, it turns out that it is, or at least it, it can be. So in this case, compounds one and two enrich at the six hour and 22 hour time point, 
but only compound one shows up at the two hour time point. As you go from two to six to 22 hours, you get more and more hits showing up. However, some of the hits that show up at the two hour time point are now sort of wiped out and you don't see them at the 22 hour time point. So these are the sorts of things that you have to think about when you go into a covalent screen and probably why it's important to have a large, dat a large database of screens you've done in the past to help you guide, to help guide you. Okay. Um, going back to decades, everyone has always thought that macrocycles would be a great thing to do when making DELs, um, probably because you have those peptide bonds and AMD bonds or some, something that DEL does pretty well. Um, and so uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about the macrocycle DELs that, that we at Wuxi have, and I'm going to show you a POC. It's something that we have, pup, uh, that we have written up, we have submitted, um, it hasn't published yet, so you will be the first humans outside of the Wuxi sphere to actually see this data, so congrats on that. All right, so I have three macrocycle DELs on the far right, and I have the two linear precursors that we've set aside that lead to those macrocyclic DELs. These DELs vary between six and nine amino acids in their size. And in this case, we have gone with macrocycles where the diversity is extreme, extremely large. Um, we can talk about later, maybe during the Q&A, the good and the bad points about that. But in this case, we've gone with DELs that are extremely large in size. And now, of course, the question is with these very large DELs and with the multiple chemical steps, are the DELs too large? Is the synthetic yields, are they good or not? Can you find hits? And of course, the easiest, the easiest way to answer that question is run the screen, you find hits, and you know that things are working well. Okay, so we partnered with a company called Unnatural Products, um, UNP. They know a lot about MDM2, and they know a lot about doing the follow-up work that needs to be done, and we know a lot about making the macrocycle DELs and doing the screen, so it was a nice match. MDM2 is a relevant target and that people know about it well, but at the same time, it's been around for a while, so it's sort of become a bit academic, let's say. So it was a, a POC where we felt we could run the screen and we could publish the data. And in this case, we're specifically looking for interactions to block MDM2 interacting with P53. It's a known P PPI. So we run the screen. And we find the traditional cube here. And of course, the cube is full of potential hits. And what we do first is we get rid of those data points, which are somewhat weaker enriched. And what we're left with are more features. So we see many different lines that we could potentially follow, follow up. And we sort of zoom in on one of the data points, which is enriched the most strongly. Uh, the structure is shown here. It's pretty tough to see on this slide, but it is blown up larger in these two shown here. When the original Dell was made, the building block at this position was actually a RASMATE. And these are the two chirally resolved versions that we have synthesized. One of them has shown up at 43 nanomolar potency in the TR fret assay between MDM2 and P53. And the other one is a nine nanomolar hit. And so we look at this as nice proof that for whatever the goods or the bads are about the macrocycle hits and the Dells and the way that they were made, we can run a screen, we can see enrichment, we can resynthesize them, and we can find potent hits. And so we feel that um, all of this comes together to say that the DELs or these macrocycle DELs are worth screening. Sometimes people are very cynical and they don't believe a TR fret and they don't believe a biochemical assay and they don't believe the compound was synthesized or whatever. It's nice to have a crystal structure. With the crystal structure, you see the macrocycle uh, interacting with, uh, with um, MDM2. You can also see which amide bonds are important for interactions with the protein, and you can see which amide bonds potentially aren't and could be altered in order to help these macrocycles get inside of cells. Currently, these macrocycles, as is, do not enter cells. So... Machine learning is certainly a topic that comes up quite often. Um, I'll, I'll take it from a slightly different 
thought approach. And that is when we run a Dell screen, we get a lot of data. We get thousands of data points. We usually follow up maybe 20 of those data points, maybe 100. And the other 19,900, we just shove in some database somewhere, never to be looked at again. Sort of a waste. Um, what's nice about the machine learning is that it pulls out these data points, all the ones which we normally ignore and we throw away, and it presumably can do something good with them. And so we can run a Dell screen and we can build a classifier around all those 20,000 20, data points. We can then go and look at the commercial collections of what people sell right off the shelf. We can use the classifier to choose which ones we want to buy at a relatively low price, and then we can test them in order to find out if they are indeed active. Most of the thrust of this is based upon the idea of let's buy potential hits that have a molecular weight below 400. This does differ a little bit from your normal Dell screen where you often end up in more of a drug-like space, whereas a lot of MedChem teams would like to start off in that lower lead-like space. And, and that is one of the strengths, I think, of working in the ML space. So again, that's a nice idea, but the idea really doesn't have much value unless you can actually present a POC and you can show that it actually works. So let's try to do that. In this case, we look at the enzyme HO1. Um, it has a heme at its active site. And I should also point out that there's a related counter screening enzyme HO2, and that is not a trivial matter to find something that's selective for HO1 versus HO2. And also, I don't believe I've heard much or maybe anything in the machine learning field about using the Dell data to find hits that are selective in a counter screen. And so this is a nice case of that as well. So I'm going to jump right into the results of it and just say that we ran the screen, we built the classifier, we ordered the ligands, we tested them, and what we found were numerous different scaffolds. Um, we do hope to publish this, so one day these colorful circles will disappear, but in the meantime, if you're a chemist, sorry. And we often have found hits that are over a hundredfold selective for HO1 over HO2. And indeed, many of these hits are also extremely active. As we can see here, the most potent was 21 nanomolar. Um, so there's a lot of numbers on this slide, but let me attract your attention to this box on the right, probably the most important one, where we show that if we looked at the top three hits that came out of this exercise, so these are the compounds that we bought off the shelf and we tested, that the average molecular weight of these hits was 371 grams per mole. If you look at the top hits that came directly out of the Dell screen, the average molecular weight was 534. Um, this one-to-one -one comparison isn't, it's not quite fair because the top hits coming out of the Dell screen are in terms of, of, of potency, not the best looking hits, you know, in their overall prof profile. But still, this is something that we quite often see when we use M ML, we're focused on purchasing hits that weigh less. And of course, those hits do indeed end up weighing less. Okay. So the other problem that we, we all have when we work in the Dell field is we need to find hits that are different from the hits that we found in the past. And we want to find, let's just say, more and better hits. So how do you find more and better hits every year? The answer for that generally is you make new Dells and you buy synthons that are new as well so that you can incorporate those into your new Dells. And so on the bottom of this slide, I try to highlight, highlight what we have done Sort of late last year and early this year, the Dells that we've made and the structures that we've made to put into our new Dell Pro and our new Dell Lite, with the goal, of course, being able to find new and better hits every single year. So we've made 34 Dells either in the second half of last year or early this year, and we are currently now putting those into our new Dell pools. Those contain about 4.7 billion structures total. Um, about 60 million of those new structures fit within the rule of four. So we've doubled the number of lead-like structures now within our Dells. 
And we've bought 2,000 new synthons that we have been using and incorporating in these new Dells. And of course, the building blocks themselves contain chemistries that we can't make or use when we build the Dells. And so that's a way to incorporate brand new things there. So my plan was to actually skip these next two slides, just in the interest of time. And if I have time, I'll come back. But I want to make sure that I have time to talk about the OBOC work, which has come up a few times here. And, and OBOC can take a little while to explain. But with luck, Brian Pagel and the Kadata group have already come up here, and Godis as well. And they've talked about a lot of these basics which makes my life a little bit easier. Now I don't have to tell people about what a bead is and how you can put a compound on a bead and a barcode on, on a bead and, and other things. But what I do want to say is that we've been working in this OBOC field for about 18 months now. Um, largely our focus has been on helping people who do OBOC screening being able to make their OBOC DELs. And so we at Wuxi, we, we can make these OBOC DELs. And we have numerous... Uh, reactions which we have mastered and we can use in order to make these DELs and then we make these DELs for our partners which then can go off and do the screening with them. However, I do want to touch lightly upon the screening itself. So you have two different ways that you can do these screens and the activity-based screening we at Wuxi, we do plan on offering this as a service maybe later this year. It's not exactly sure of when. And then you have an affinity-based screening, which you can also do. And that's something which we can do right now. So uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what the differences between these two things are. So for the affinity-based screening, you don't need to release the ligand from the bead. So what you're looking for is you have ligand on a bead, and then you're attracting a protein target, or preferably in this case, two protein targets to your bead. So GSK spoke about this earlier, the goal of finding glues. And we have seen in those selection methodologies that it can be tough, right? It can be tough with the solution phase DELs in order to pull out structures that are truly bringing two different targets together at the same place. But this is something which with a bead, and I'll show you on the next slide, can be done in a more ready fashion. With the activity-based screens, you can UV cleave the ligand from the bead, and then you can run, let's say, a cell-based screen or any kind of assay that you would like. Most of the assays that H, uh, HTS might be able to run. This is tougher to do. Um, there are many companies out here that do this or at least claim to, um, and that's something which we'll probably be offering later in the year. Okay, so, so let's go back for a moment to the uh, to the affinity-based OBOC screening. So what we can do here is we can make up a, a, an OBOC DEL. And the purpose of this OBOC DEL can be to bring target one and target two together with the ligand on the bead acts as the glue. And depending upon what your tagging system is on those two different pro on, on the two different targets, you can then fluorescently label them in different ways. And then you can sort just for those beads that have actually captured both your protein targets. And that's something with normal solution phase style you can't really do. Um, but it is something which you can clearly do with these OBOC DELs. And we do give you an example here of a test case that we have done at Wuxi, where we have a, a tool attached to a bead and we, when we compare those to the beads that don't have the tool, we can see that we end up with a nice, clear separation and the ability to separate those, those beads on a fax from the beads that don't have the tool attached. And of course, when we don't have the proper tool uh, attached, that separation can't happen because we can't bring both of those targets uh, in the same place on those beads with the fluorescent signal is now altered. So I have no idea how much time I have left. Maybe you can, what? I've lost all track of time. Okay, all right. I, I think we should jump into the questions, yeah. 
Yeah. So, so with that, I would like to thank our many sponsors, uh, our, our many partners who we have worked with. We're, of course, we at Wuxi, without our partners, we can't really do anything. Um, and of course, to all of you, both here in person and online, there might be some people uh, as well. Uh, thank you for showing up over your lunchtime and listening. And, and with that, yeah, I'd like to jump into the questions in case there are any. And um, yeah. So Alex, just to for your uh, OVOC library, the essay you showed, do you need to cleave that? Do you need to cleave the bead? No, 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 right. no. So, so life is much easier if you don't need to cleave the ligand from the bead. But the, you, you still do the droplet screening. No, there's no, 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 drop, no droplet, droplet screening. Okay. Exactly. Basically, just a function assay. Uh, but it's it's not a function. It's it's yeah. a direct binding assay. A direct binding assay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a very quiet group. Okay. Any other questions? Just quickly ask. So, um, is the block libraries are getting into the open door space as well? So, when what is your plan to? So, so I, I don't have any plans on moving the OBOC DELs into the open DEL space, no. Um, and and I don't know what groups would do with the OBOC DELs. It, it's definitely, um, with the solution phase DELs, it's much better known how to screen them. With, with the OBOC DELs, it's, it's not. So, yeah, I, I would say that's on a come back in 10 years, and maybe the answer would be different. <laughs> No, did you, did, I have longer, unfortunately. <laughs> did you say that the um, macrocycle Dell was part of the open Dell? The macrocycle Dell is not part okay. of the open Dell. No, no. Um, with that said, the, the open Dell does contain a lot of large physical structures, but mm. it doesn't contain the macrocycles. And uh, in terms of the, you know, the academic collaborations, do you... Um, engage in any sort of uh, back and forth in terms of design of new Dells? Like could an academic lab suggest a, a Dell? Yeah, I, I, yeah, we we are always fine with suggestions. Yeah, of course, those are easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and and and, and, and that won't fall upon completely deaf ears <laughs> either, I wanna say. Just partially. Yeah, yeah par partially, um, but we are pretty open. Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, and one, can I ask another question? Um, yeah. are, how much are you uh, are you doing any sort of the sort of proximity labeling to enhance local concentration stuff that like Casey Cruzmark is doing? We uh, we do have an interest in this, and we do have yeah. POCs on ongoing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And maybe if this conference took place in in a city such as Boston, that's so sunny. A month yeah. later, <laughs> we would have had that data. But <laughs> right on. It was nice in Switzerland when I left. Yeah, it was like sunny ski slopes. I'm freezing here. Any okay. Oh, yeah. Can you comment on the relative diversity and utility of a cyclic peptide gel versus, let's say, mRNA? Yeah, so so the main theme here, and, and and I've worked with some mRNA display people, so I've had back back and uh, forth. So so the biggest problem is to get a macrocycle that gets inside of a cell, and in our case study isn't a great example of solving that because ours didn't get inside of a cell either. But we have um, we used five hundred different amino acids, and we can use amino acids that are very different from like a naturally occurring one. In an mRNA, they are capable of getting away from the unnatural amino acid space, but they're still structurally pretty similar. And, and so there, the at least the longer term goal would be that with, with us, it's probably an easier path to making ma macrocycles that can get inside of cells. And with mRNA, 
it seems like a never ending challenge. Um, and, and I also know that when they've started making cyclic structures that end up being smaller, then they have a much lower success rate of finding hits. So they seem to be a little stuck. They're, they're ex great ways to find potent tools, but a drug that gets inside of a cell and does what it wants is really, really tough. And so maybe the Dell space might be able to, um, you know, come in from the left lane and kind of cut, cut them off and do a bit better there. But, but, but they haven't done it yet though. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Thank you very much.